Today I want to talk about a subject that's very important to me, um, mainly because of its neglect. I made a list of eight things that I think are critically important to the study of Tai Chi Chuan. The first one on the list was posture. The second one on the list was Chan Su Jing. Chan Su Jing is what I want to talk about today. I think Chan Su Jing is an extremely important element to Tai Chi Chuan in particular, but in particular to the Yang style. And I feel that most of the Yang style teaching today has neglected it to a certain extent. I found that it's um, revival, let's say, in my school, in my classes, has reaped extremely good rewards. Uh, it solves a lot of problems of, uh, that appear in other cases, in other situations. Uh, it's, it's spoken of in the classics as though its only real function is to provide power. At least that's the assumption you can make. Uh, the classics say the internal force is only stored having a surplus by means of the curved. Whenever they use like words like curved and straight, they're talking about linear use of the muscles and winding use of the muscles. Now, the chance of Jing uh, is particularly about uh, what's called a silk reeling force. Don't make anything too mysterious about this or something too internal about it. Whenever they speak of internal force or internal movement, they're talking about Chan Su Jing. And it's a kind of simple definition. Like I say, it doesn't refer to something mysterious that's happening on the inside of your body or something like this. And it doesn't refer to some movement of qi in particular. As the classics say, put your mind on the movement, not on the qi. When you uh, train your movement over the years and the movement becomes finer and finer, and Another classic refers to this, it says, uh, first make movements big, then move, make movements smaller, and finally the movements, you, your movements become fine and delicate. So it's a process, and that's why the movements in the form are quite large. When you actually use Tai Chi, they're very small. But uh, they must be large in the beginning to ensure that all, everything is working. The Chen Su Jing movements are the same. They are uh, in practice. They're very large rotations of different parts of the body. When you actually use it, these rotations become quite small and fine. But only if you have practiced them in a kind of fulsome sort of way do they become really fine and delicate. That is to say, they become connected in such a way that they can transfer energy. The first step to transferring energy is to transfer a change of movement. In other words, uh, the definition of a wave is something which one part affects another part, which affects another part, which affects another part. Almost any sense in which this is done, you can call it a wave. I mean, you can even talk about, you know, grandma's gossiping over fences. <laughs> you know, go over one fence and another fence and another fence. Even this is a kind of a wave of information that happens. So what we want is to cultivate a wave of movement that finally becomes extremely connected and utilizes the entire body. And the way this is accomplished the most efficiently is with Chan Su Jing. If I do something like this, in a sense, that's a wave because one part of my arm is transferring force to another part of my arm. But this is called external movement because it moves externally through space. If you could imagine yourself sort of being chained to a wall or something and say, well, I still want to exercise in some way, but I can't move my arms and legs, you could still rotate them. Uh, and by doing that, you would have uh, this winding movement occur. Now, the winding movement was first invented, you might say, uh, by Bodhidharma when he transferred the I Jing Jing uh, exercises to the monks of the Shaolin Temple. And this is what eventually became their martial art. Uh, when Bodhidharma arrived, they were not martial artists, they were just meditators, they were monks, they were Buddhists. He found them to be, you know, ill and, you know, not healthy enough. So he was a great fighter and he transferred this, this uh, method which is called I Ching Ching. Now, Jim and Ching used to say there, there are three internal forms of boxing. 
there is uh, Bagua Chang, Xing Yi Chuan, Tai Chi Chuan, and then he would stick his thumb up in the air. And he would say, and then there's the I Ching Ching, it is half internal. Because these were exercises actually designed for the monks to use, like sitting on their cushions and stuff. So eventually this developed into movements that they would make uh, with the arms, and they would stand in you know, stronger positions. So Shaolin boxing developed as a combination of these very strong positions of the legs with these Changsujing movements of the arms. Now, sometimes Tai Chi Chuan is referred to as whole body movement. What they mean by this is that this internal movement, the movement they're referring to as internal movement, by whole body, they mean it, the principle is transferred not only in the arms, but to the legs. And so the legs begin to use Chan Jing also. So to make things easier to explain, first I will explain the Chan Jing movements of the arms. And then by analogy, it will be much more easy to understand the Chan Jing movements of the legs. Now the body is traditionally uh, broken into 13 parts because we have three parts of the arm, three parts of the leg, that makes 12 parts in all, and then we consider the torso as one piece, and that makes 13 parts. But from the point of view of rotation, there are only nine parts, because the hand and the forearm cannot rotate in opposite directions. If I turn the arm this way, the hand this way, obviously the forearm is also turning that way. But the upper arm can rotate in a different way. So uh, I'll explain this by saying, will identify the movements. If I turn both parts out this way, we can call this a yin direction of both parts of the arm. Both parts are rotating outward like this. If I rotate both parts inward, this is a yang rotation of the arms. Now, you can do this in any position, here, here, and uh, in Bagua, they this bagua is called bagua jiang because jiang means palm because they make a big point of rotating the palms back and forth. This emphasizes these yang and yin movements of the arms. The movements in Tai Chi Chuan are complex in the sense that we have many movements which are counter rotations. In other words, suppose I rotate the upper part of the arm out, but I can still rotate the lower part in by turning the palm like this. And this position is designated as an because an means push, and this looks like you're pushing. Another sort of problem of translation in Tai Chi Chuan is that sometimes verb, words are translated and assumed to be verbs when actually the Chinese language is very pictographic and everything is kind of like an image. So when it says push, it doesn't mean that you use this to push things with. It means it looks like you are pushing. Now, if we have the opposite change, we rotate the upper part in and the lower part out. So the upper part is yang, the lower part is yin. We call this peng. And peng, especially if we do it with both arms, has this rounded look to it. And that's what peng means. It means kind of like rounded or swollen, but uh, having a circular shape, like a ball. And when, and it's a common word, you know, you might use it for, you know, things that spoil in the refrigerator and start to explode and they make this like dome of uh, uh, pressure. So it has a look, this look, kind of look to it. But in Tai Chuan and in martial arts, this is designated as Pung of the arm. And it's, there's a character for Pung and then there's this character for the arm saying, this is what we're talking about, this movement. Now, this movement has a special, a special additional quality to it, uh, or movement to it, and that is with the shoulders. The torso is considered one piece, and it's generally made into a completely unified object, which doesn't have any kind of, you know, separations like this. Now, there's certain movements in which you are allowed to bend the back, and maybe bend parts of the back, or the lower back, but for the most part, this remains straight. But the pung of the arms has a special use in Tai Chi Chuan 
and it's used as a ward off in the sense that you can use this to sort of catch the force of an opponent. And if you catch the force of the opponent and your shoulders are in their normal, completely relaxed position, this is very likely to dislocate the shoulder. So when you present pung of the arm, when you present pung, it's called, you want to also present the shoulder so it creates a kind of space here, so that there's a kind of extra margin of space, so that this can have an extra bit of relief when it absorbs something. Now the pung can be big and it can be small. If you'll notice, when you make the pung smaller, you do not fold it in like this, but the elbow tends to drop like this. So this is a kind of classic motion of Tai Chi Chuan, that you're sort of catching something with your pung like this, and then you're expelling it. And interestingly enough, these are not reversed motions. You don't make pung if you catch it and then release the pung as you know, but you just keep making pung. You make pung in small, and then as you extend it, you keep stretching it. Now, this produces a kind of twisting, stretching uh, in the arms. And this is very much like when you take a towel or something and you twist it and you want to wring it out. You don't just twist it, but you stretch it like this. And so if we have pung, it is stretched by extending it. And as I say, you want to have the habit of extending the shoulder when you do it. In this position, there is a kind of maximum distance you can open like this. And this is, of course, I could open them bigger, but that would cause distortion of the back and of the arms and of all kinds of things. So if I keep the back plucked up correctly and then open this to its you know, maximum extent, by tradition, I should be able to just barely see my hands with the corners of my eyes. And sometimes it's taught in this external way. So it's like, this is how far you open. But it's not a matter of just saying, I'm just going to stop there and not keep going. You should feel like it stops. You can't open any farther. <clears throat> now, the opposite change is on this way. And when you make on, you don't want the shoulder in this presented position. You want it in a relaxed position. And when you, so when you change from pung to on, you do not forcefully pull the shoulders back. You simply release them back into their natural position. There's a good rule of posture uh, about the shoulders, that the shoulders should never be anything more than the maximum, uh, anything less than the maximum width and flatness that they can be. In other words, you never pinch them back, you never raise them up. They're just completely relaxed and kind of like you imagine them sort of sloping down from the neck, always like this. So <clears throat> you have these two positions of the shoulders, forward when you have pung, and back to a relaxed position when you have on. Now, when you are making Chan Tzu Jing happen, it's very important that you not only make all the winding things happen, but you, you make them happen in a serial way. And that serial way is always the same, from the center of the body out. In other words, you would not turn the hand first and then fix this and then move your shoulder, but in the opposite way. You would present the shoulder, then you would make whatever change you want to make in the upper arm and then the lower arm, and this presents a kind of elegant movement. <clears throat> Same way when you release it. You release the shoulders first, then the upper arm rotates out, the lower arm rotates in, and it becomes um. So you can change from pung to arm. Um. So you have four essential positions of the arms. And that is all the way yang, all the way yin, half yin, half yang, and then half yin, half yang on the other way. And since you have two arms, <laughs> this presents a lot of possibilities because one arm can be pung, one arm can be an. And another really important thing about Chan Tzu Jing is uh, it's always changing. And so it's not really about the final positions. In fact, when you actually use Chan Tzu Jing, you really don't want to ever quite get to these final positions because in a final position, there's no more margin to go either way. And the real power of Tai Chi Chuan is from change. So everything is kind of in the middle. But you want. 
So, but when you practice, it's just like when you, you know, exercise anything, you want to stretch it to its maximum. And then when you release it, it has a lot of softness and relaxation. That's why it says first learn to stretch, then learn to shrink. So in the form, you'll see a lot of extensions, for instance, of the double push, that look like you're practicing actually pushing something. What you're actually practicing is the extension of this, and so that it stretches out. When you use it, you do not use it in this extended way. And that's why there's another classic about the internal force that says it can extend, but it is not extended. <clears throat> That's the meaning of that. When you use it, it doesn't mean you don't extend it when you're in the form. In the form, as I say, you're trying to make these big positions and stretch things. So what you're always referring to is the change. So if I were to have a pung position that was completely you know, extended and stretched, and I were to start changing it to the on position, I would call this change on, even though until it gets all the way to here, it doesn't look like on. So what you're talking about when you really speak of Chan Tzu Jing is you're talking about the active dynamic change. It's extremely important in Tai Chi Chuan that everything be dynamic, especially these Chan Tzu Jing inner movements. For instance, uh, there's a movement ward off left where you use ward off in this way, but you don't make this position and then <laughs> ram it into someone in this fixed way. But all the time it's moving, it's always developing anytime it's developing. And so that's the reason that uh, Yang Chen Fu actually took the discharges out of the long form. Uh, in the original long form, people would practice getting to a certain point and showing some kind of, you know, fa jing, so the release of jing. But he said, no, this gives the impression that you can only release jing in these kind of finished positions. And his word on the subject was, anytime you can release jing. So, it's not a good thing to be practicing because then you sort of are striving for some sort of final position that you can do this in. For instance, if I'm doing the push, this can release Jing, which is in, when you fa Jing, as, Jiang, as uh, Yang Chen Fu said, it's always over a distance of an inch or less. When you do this, it always is like a short little movement. So you must realize always that you're practicing softness even though when you practice in the form, you may feel a lot of stretching and a lot of sort of tension, but you're not striving for this tension. You're just striving to sort of increase your margin so that eventually your movements become fine and delicate. Now, in the next lecture, I will go into the chancellor of the legs, which is extremely analogous to the chancellor of the arms.